Hello everyone. Thanks for uh, tuning in today. What I wanted to do was show you a game that I've actually kind of forgotten how to play. Uh, so why would I want to show you a game I forgot how to play? Because I think it's a great game. I actually have had this now for a few years. I'm thinking I picked this up either 2013, 2014. Um, I had just started getting into to wargaming. I had picked up Panzer 2nd Edition by GMT Games and uh, I had seen some, some reviews on this and thought this was a fascinating uh, looking game. So I picked it up and I think it's great. So the, the series that it's supposed to be is Fighting Formations and this particular uh, game was focusing on the Gross Deutschland Motorized Infantry Division. It kind of follows them through the early years of uh, World War II on the East Front. So why do I like this game? Uh, first of all, this was a uh, Chad Jensen design. He did Combat Commander and I thought that was a fantastic game system. Uh, that was one that I had picked up. I think I got Combat Commander before I got this one. Um, yeah, I would just had got stuck on GMT games. They're really good. And this is a card assisted game. So it's not card driven but it does have cards, has uh, fairly big maps. Uh, the map designs kind of remind me of Combat Commander a little bit as far as the graphics go, but they're, they're really good. Um, I, the thing, though, that really drew me was the counters. I'm a huge counter art fan type of person, and these counters are double-sided in an interesting way, and I'll show you how this works. But um, there's some other really interesting things that I thought made this game really, really cool to play. So I hope to open this up and kind of show it to you. Now, because I haven't played this in a few years, I know that this is kind of a mess. Oh, so why, why am I showing this again? Okay, well, one, I like it. Uh, but two, I was on Facebook, and I forget which Facebook group I was on, but there's a, a post of some folks that are playing this, and they were sharing some pictures of it. And I thought, well, that's awesome. All these years later, you know, some folks are... are uh, picking this up maybe for the first time. I'm not saying this was an unpopular game, but I don't think it did as well as I hoped it would. I think Chad is now coming out with an expansion because I think the game is picking up popularity. Um, I have some thoughts on, on why it didn't do so as well as I thought, but I think it was more to do with some things that people were saying on like Board Game Geek about it and whatnot. Um, but if you just take aside the fact of the, the focus, which was Gross Deutschland Division, and just focus on the gameplay mechanics, I think what you'll see is a really, really good game. I don't want to get into the, the, the story behind why I thought I did wrong or why I didn't do so well. And just focus on the game, because I think if you give this game a chance, you're going to see it's really good. So here I've got German Infantry more German infantry and I'll, I'll show you why they're in two bags most because there are several types of infantry but I have them in two bags for a reason and then here's Russian infantry I know I used to have these in GMT trays but since I couldn't really find a whole lot of people that played and, and when I was playing solo it was easy for me just to kind of keep stuff in baggies but hopefully with the expansion maybe I'll convince my wife to let me get some more GMT storage trays or, or find something to sort it out better. Uh, but again, the tanks for the Germans and Russians are going to be in two baggies. So I'm just going to set those off to the side for a moment. Alright, then you have two sets of cards. I had uh, German cards and Russian cards. And they're nice. Everything about GMT games usually really, really good quality and art. And then a whole bunch of status markers and tokens. And one aspect that I thought was really good was your damage counters. Representing infantry or vehicle wounds. Random event markers. And your wooden tokens for managing uh, resources. And your dice. I think this is one thing that maybe turned off some of your traditionalist war gamers was dice. So if you set aside um, maybe some of the political ideas, I think some war gamers 
didn't like the idea of using multiple dice to do things. I, I actually thought it was pretty neat, kind of innovative, and I'll show you what that's about. All right, and then we've got some items in here. So you can get this on uh, Vassal Engine if you want, but the thing with Vassal Engine is you don't get all of the player aid charts for like the artillery results and uh, assault combat and different things like that. So not all the player aids are available on the internet that I'm aware of. Maybe they are now because the game's a little old. But you had a couple player aid charts. I think it's two of the same. Oh no, here's a train chart. Uh, here's the one with the um, the melee tables. Alright. Typical kind of stuff. Then we've got the maps. We'll unfold all the maps because some of the maps are kind of kind of big. But uh, what were these? I feel like they're a little bit bigger than one inch hexes, maybe an inch and a half. I think the hexes were a little bit bigger than an inch just to accommodate the oversized vehicle counters, which we'll look at. Then you had, I know I've got more maps in the box here. Then there's the playbook, and this is actually a very hefty playbook. Uh, quite a bit of rules. So like a lot of games, you'll have the basic series rules, and then um, here's some rules specific to Gross Deutschland box. And it had quite a few scenarios, too. And a nice extensive order of battle. So a lot of research went into this game. I think that's one thing I've always enjoyed about Chad Jensen games. It just feels like there's a lot of, of research to back up what, what they do. Uh, and then it was a nice full color. So this is a, a phenomenal, phenomenal book. And then it, this is all examples of play at the end. So is the game a little more complex than uh, your average war game? I, uh, I don't know if I want to say it's more complex. Maybe... You know, yes, a little more complex, fiddly perhaps. There's some little things that make it unique, but I truly believe once you have it down, it's not that bad. I mean, here the rules are 23 pages, and then again, you know, you got the playbook with some specific rules like the random events and whatnot. But 23 pages of rules really isn't that bad for kind of a tactical game. We have here your fate card, which is one of those cards that, uh, you know, if you play it, you hand it to your opponent, and then they get to, you know, like re-roll dice or something like that. All right, so fate card. And then I think in the box here, I just have a few more, more maps. I don't think I've got any other. Yeah, that's all maps. So quite a few maps. Let me put that map away. All right, so what, what made this kind of fun and unique? Well, quite a few things, actually. Let me put the two player aid charts away. Uh, the player aid charts, you know, nothing totally unexpected for a war game. Just some quick cheat sheets. Here's direct fire combat uh, summary, dice summary, because uh, that's how combat worked is you had like a, a basic to hit die, and then based on the modifiers, you just change the type of die you would roll to get your hit. So... Uh, I thought that was easy and um, accuracy, like a uh, barrage table, stuff like that. I mean, so typical things you find on the player aid chart. Nothing too crazy. But here's what made this fun. And, and I think maybe we'll remind some folks of like Combat Commander, but the really extra long, extra big play aid chart where it has, let me turn that a little bit has a lot of player knowledge type of stuff here. You know, your turn track, initiative track, uh, keeping track of firepower track, things like that. And of course, you know, a little bit of a game summary on here. But this is what made the game really, really kind of cool. Innovative, if you will. It's the order matrix. So the way this works is you got your cubes and your scenario is going to tell you at the beginning of the game how to seed your order matrix. So it might, I'll just put one each here. Uh, 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 just to show you. And I think this is probably another reason why the game didn't catch on to a lot of folks is because now when you include wooden blocks and things like that, people start thinking Euro game. Uh, and back when I started getting into wargaming, there, there was like a really 
I don't want to use the word elitist, but there was like a really strong sense of what makes a war game, like what officially is a war game. I think a lot of people were really kind of comparing everything at the time to Advanced Squad Leader and trying to understand how games fit in. But I think now we're at a time where gameplay is so diverse uh, that war game can encompass a lot of things. And I think that if people come back to this, they'll see that this is actually a pretty cool concept uh, that I've seen. I haven't seen anything quite like this in other games, but the idea that your armies facing each other get maybe a certain amount of advantages, disadvantages based on you know, um, how like high command would run things or uh, national priorities. So for example here with the order matrix, to determine initiative it wasn't really based on a dice roll. What you would do is each army could do an action and it would cost you a certain amount of resources is how I looked at it. Uh, this resource chart, I always thought of this as like representing your ability to communicate, uh, fuel, ammo, things like that. So for example, uh, German troops put a lot of emphasis on fire, accuracy, aiming, things like that, uh, at least according to the game. They probably explain it a lot better than I do, but uh, the Soviet player, they said a lot more emphasis was on movement because they had a lot more troops, things like that. So if I wanted to fire with a German unit, I would take my block cube off of fire, because now I know I've spent two initiative, put this over here in the used order cubes, and I would move the initiative order two points towards the Russian player. I would then execute all of the fire orders that I would have on the map, and then, since the initiative is over on the Russian player's side, he would now get to choose something that they would want to do. Uh, maybe the Russian player wanted to fire, but because they didn't place an emphasis as much on accurate firing and whatnot, their fire costs a little bit more. So they would want to do a fire. So they'd take it off the three, put it in the used cubes, and then move the marker three. One, two, three. Then the Russian player would execute all of their fire orders. And it kind of goes back and forth. So for example, a lot of these cubes are the same cost for things. Uh, mostly the difference was in move and fire, who placed emphasis where. I'm sure over time people could make customized order uh, templates to really show differences between maybe specific units. Uh, you know, maybe maybe, well, here's another difference here. Sniper costs a lot more points for the Germans versus it's only five for the Russians because I think a lot of people think that the, uh, you know, Russians used a lot more snipers than, say, the Germans did. So it's cheaper for the, the Russians to get a sniper in. Uh, you know, so I'm sure people could make even more customized tracks, which would be interesting because maybe, you know, an SS unit might have one versus, say, a guards unit. Anyway, uh, so now it's back on the German side, and so they want battalion support. They want to draw one asset card. So that's going to cost eight. So they pull the cube off eight, and they got to shift this eight. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, now the initiative is back on the Russian player's side, and they got to think, well, what, what do I do? Do I play an asset card from my hand? That's only one initiative. Bloop. And the initiative is still on the Russian player's side. So maybe now they want to rally some of their troops that were wounded during combat. And that's four. One, two, three, four. Uh, and then, you know what, it's still over here. Uh, they say, you know what, I, I want to do something, but I don't want to throw too much initiative back towards the German player. So maybe I want to fire. But there's no more cubes in fire. But what the game does, it says you can spend a higher cube to use any action that costs lower than this. So maybe Russian troops are set up in such a way that they can effectively fire on a bunch of German units. So, um, but we don't want to swing the initiative too much towards the German player, so I'm going to spin my sniper counter. And instead of doing a sniper action, we're going to do a fire. But I still got to move it five. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, so now the initiative is back on the German player side. And this is how it goes back and forth. And for the most part, you know, it works out pretty well. You're ending up that uh, by the time you start getting near the end of the, the order matrix, that you're still only performing one, you know, two, maybe three things at the most. 
Um, you know, because a lot of your units and things, they can't move more than once in a turn anyway. So you're still running into a situation where, you know, I might do an advance and move at six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, and, but then again, if the Russians want to do an assault, that's seven. So you got to shift it back. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, but now that they've assaulted and moved some stuff, maybe now the Germans have some units that haven't fired yet this turn. So they, they do a, they have to spend nine because they don't want to spend a 10. They want to, they don't want to give too much to the opponent. So they go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Do their fire action, which is normally two. So a lot of the game is deciding when to spend low cost on the matrix versus high cost. So yeah, you end up occasionally where you have to buy something expensive and it gives your player a chance to do some cheap orders maybe. But ultimately, as the turn progresses, you have fewer and fewer things that can move, shoot, and fire. So you still only end up maybe doing one or two things. It, it, has, it seems to have a balance to it. I've never really played a game where I felt like one player was always throwing 10 and 9 cubes at somebody and the other player was just constantly picking one and two order things. But, uh, you know, I'm not sure if, if, if maybe this was a turnoff for people. You know, they just said it felt fiddly. I'm not, I'm not really sure the exact why people didn't like it. But that's kind of the heart that drove the game. And uh, overall, it actually worked, I think, really well. So we'll just set that order matrix aside. All right, so we got baggies. Why do we got two, two bags for vehicles? Well, this is another innovative thing. This is a platoon level game. So the hexes might be like one and a half physical inches, but they represented, I think, uh, 75 yards across. And that's because, if I open up a baggie here that you can't see, we'll try and zoom in maybe, you can see these a little better. You have platoon vehicles, squad vehicles, platoons of soldiers and equipment, and then platoons and, and squads. So let's just zoom in here real quick so I can show you this. I'll move these up here. And hopefully, let me see if I can turn a light on. Try not to oversaturate with light. All right, so what are we looking at? Well, I grabbed, I grabbed two vehicles. These just happen to be two different vehicles, but uh, let me see if I can find another Stug. Uh, let's see if I can find a platoon Stug real quick. Yeah, I probably should have done a better job preparing for this, but just pulling stuff out to show you here. Let's do a Stug. Alright, so you have platoon versions of vehicles, and same with the Russians. They have platoon versions of vehicles and squads, and uh, the Germans, same thing. Now, this is pretty neat. One, the vehicle counters were bigger. Let me grab, let me grab, grab some infantry. And the infantry, I think these are half-inch counters. I don't want to say five-eighths, because I could be wrong, but they're either five-eighths or half-inch and let me grab a platoon of grenadier. So the idea here is that you could either continually play your people in. Oh, I found a squad grenadier in my platoon bag. Oops, got to fix that. So you could either play uh, your platoons at full strength, or as you take casualties, what you could do is convert them into uh, squads. So if I had this guy running around and there was enough damage to, you know, cause a loss of, of soldiers, I could then break it down into grenadiers, which is kind of neat. Or if I really wanted to, prior to any kind of combat casualties, I could break it down into squads. Now why would I do that? Well, your platoon has a lot more firepower if they're together as a platoon, it's coordinated. Your squads have less firepower if they break down. And that makes sense, right? They're not as coordinated. There's not as much firepower being concentrated into one spot, or at least maybe not at the same time. Um, or, and, and it's fewer people if it's due to casualties that you have to break it down. So this also does give you some flexibility because maybe you need to spread out and capture several victory 
point hexes that are next to each other. Um, maybe, maybe sometimes you're assaulting and for some reason you think having three squads to spread the firepower around or to take uh, uh, casualties is a little bit safer than keeping everything as a platoon. I mean, it's just options and choices based on the situation. So that's the first thing. You have platoon versions of the counters and squad versions. Now the counters are double-sided, but see that's not how they marked casualties. So if you flip the counter, it's not to a weaker side, it's to the active side. So what's really cool is these counters have a passive side and an active side. And some of the information changes based on what you're doing. So for example here, if this is the, here, let's do it with the, two squads so you can see the differences here. So if you have the active side for example, sometimes depending on the vehicle or the counter, your firepower may change because if you're moving sometimes you're not as accurate, uh, you know, so stats could change. The one stat that definitely does change is this one in the middle. So this six represents movement. When you're not moving, and this is kind of your passive or inactive side, this is mostly used to represent uh, your chance of running out of the ability to shoot. So it's kind of neat if you're doing opportunity fire and you're shooting at stuff and you roll your attack dice. If your attack dice, one of them is lower than that number there, then it's like they're done with ammo and they can't be used again that turn for like opportunity fires, or at least that segment. So there was some built-in uh, ways to track you know, ammunition shortages or reloading. Everything about the game was just really, really subtle. And when you're done moving, this is a great way to know who you've activated to do stuff because you flip them to the active side, you move them on the board, and when they're done moving, you flip them back to the inactive side and you move on to the next active unit that you have. So if I say, hey, I'm going to activate these guys, I move them, it's just a great little way to remember who you've got left that segment to do something. So again, a lot of little subtle mechanics that made it really fun to play. Now there are, let me see if the command markers are in here. Now this is something I've seen other games do, so that I wouldn't say this was innovative, but I thought it was kind of neat. Uh, so they had a command and control, so they really didn't have a separate platoon or squad leader commander that you had to move around to do stuff. You had the influence. And so you could put this down somewhere on the board. This is the Russian one, uh, so just pretend he's German. But you can put them on the map, and they have a certain amount of influence for activating stuff. And then if you were trying to activate troops that were maybe outside of that influence, their cost from the order matrix would be like double. So this, this uh, fluid commander was a very important asset to have on the board. I think you start at the zero, if I remember right. It starts at the zero side, and then on like the next turn, it flips to the one, and that one is an additional cost. So if I activate like a whole bunch of extra troops, then um, this adds to the initiative that I have to pay towards my opposing player. So there definitely gets to be a point where you're thinking about, well, how much am I activating based on my spheres of command and influence? Uh, and then once you've gone through the zero on one side, this goes into a, a reshuffling process. Anyway, so, you know, it was kind of a, an interesting system. You had to really think about where you want to put your influence of the, as a commander onto the battlefield. And this helped to simulate like fog of war, supply runs, you know, just a lot of those little, um, maybe some games over detail and over simulate your game but this just put this in a nice abstract system of command and control so you had your order matrix you had your uh, command influence on the field and all of that drove what you were able to do and how often so it was really really neat then your dice that you had you know I won't explain too much about it but let's say you're gonna shoot people well okay let me rephrase it you're not shooting people let's say you're gonna have one of your squads attack another squad. You essentially, if I remember right, I think you start with die, I think it's die sixes. Then there was a, I think die six is the lowest. So I think you start with the die eights, the yellows. And uh, you would look at the combat chart, which I have set aside, and it would say, well, based on certain modifiers, maybe you start at die 10, because that looks to be in the middle. 
but certain modifiers would either A, make it easier for you to hit the opponent, so you could go up in dice, or you can't even see the dice on the camera. So let's just move some squads out of the way. So let's say you start with these dice, and there will be certain numbers that you roll together to, to try and beat their defense. Ooh, so it's like a front defense, and then like your flanking shots. Uh, so if I was shooting this guy head on, I would need to get a 21. So on two dice, that's tough. On two die 10, that's kind of tough. Um, I don't think you can do it. But uh, you get to add like your firepower. Like I said, it's been a while. So uh, I think you get to add your firepower and the dice you roll, try to beat the defense. Uh, like I said, I forgot how to play, right? <laughs> so that's not giving you a very good uh, description of the game. But anyway... Uh, if you had certain bonuses, you could go up to a higher dice, and then the die 20 is where the highest. And of course, if you roll those, add the result together, add that to your, well, of course, that was a terrible roll. But the idea is, it makes it easier for you to hit stuff. Versus if you got things in cover, and you have to drop to a lower lower dice to try and roll, you know, 21 and add your, your combat value, that's tough. Uh, but it was a really easy way, instead of having to deal with a whole bunch of fiddly modifiers like plus one this, minus one that, you know, it, it was just simply, okay, if you're in this condition, you go up a color of dice. If you're in this condition, you go down a color of dice. And it might end up that you're right back here rolling the, the middle of the road die tens. And it was simple and quick. So you had your cards. Okay, and... They weren't anything groundbreaking either. You know, lots of card-assisted games. The cards themselves, um, I don't think, broke the game in any way. There wasn't any card that made it, you know, the game, if you played it, you would win automatically. I'm not sure they had too many of those. Um, but you could use these a couple ways. There are some actions you could do that you sacrifice a card from your hand in order to do a particular action. So these were a resource and something you could do is maybe a reaction. Here's an order. Flip any one active command marker to its other side. It just says any active command marker, friendly or enemy. So if I had my friendly counter that we talked about on the one side, and that's costing me extra initiative to do something, bam, I'll just play this, flip it to my zero side. Maybe my opponent was on the zero side, I'll just flip it to the one. So there's you know things that let you mess with people but nothing I don't think too game breaking. Uh, so there you had your cards. I'll put those away later. Don't know where I put the baggie for those. Um, yeah, so, oh, it's right here. So there's there's a lot of nice things about the game that I, I don't think were super complicated to learn. I think that it gives the game a lot of um, opportunity to grow. And from what I've heard, uh, Chad Jensen is working on a Kharkov expansion, so 1943. I think maybe the time frame hurt a little bit. I, I think a lot of people, if you're going to do East Front, I think a lot of people would have preferred like Stalingrad, but there wasn't a whole lot of vehicles there. Um, this, because uh, this was kind of following the history of the Gross Deutschland, made sense then that they kind of went from Barbarossa on. But I think the thing that really would have helped this game shine is if you had Kursk type stuff. I know Kursk gets overplayed a lot, but you know, it's tanks. People like the tanks. And I think this would have done good if they had some Tigers and some heavier uh, Russian type stuff. But Kharkov will at least give us some Tigers and maybe some bigger Russian stuff. So is there more to the game than what I've explained? Yes. Uh, there's a lot of things like a regular war game. You know, the, there's mines moving in column and, and, and smoke and a lot of things, you know, you would expect to see in a war game. It's just that some of the ways you interact with that war game were a little different than what we're used to. Uh, for example, and I think this will be the last thing I show you, the wounds. So if uh, somebody took a casualty there, boom, 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 I just pull one of these chits. And then that tells me, oh, that's a, a fire and mobility wound. And I have to roll like a 12 or higher to get rid of this. And, and uh, I would just flip it. Well, see, that's an infantry side. So if it was my vehicle that got hurt, uh, all of these damage counters were, 
double sided so if it's a tank issue or you know infantry so if I do that for a vehicle I can just place it on a vehicle and there we go that platoon is wounded see this is why I would then maybe break that down into the individual squad so that instead of the entire platoon being affected by that just the one squad so uh, you know that was kind of neat uh, could that add to the how long it took to play game? Well, sure. If you got to bust down all the platoons and individual squads and then eliminate all the squads. I think, though, I'll tell you, parting thought before I hit the stop button, that's what encouraged this game for folks to really play towards the objective. I know a lot of games you have objectives, but it feels like it still comes down to who can kill the most stuff. But if you really play towards the objectives and you end your game with a whole bunch of units still left on the field, that's perfect. Because we want you to focus on, you know, playing to the objectives of that particular scenario. And I think this game did a really good job showing that that's possible. So were there a lot of potentially a lot of stuff on the on the table after you break it down from platoons to squads? Sure. But that wouldn't necessarily make it longer unless you were really playing a game where you had to kill as many things of your opponent as possible. But anyway, final thoughts. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in. And, you know, I hope to bring you some other content later. Thanks. Bye-bye.